Today's topic, how to lower your tax bill with a donor advised fund, also known as a DAF. Now, when you usually do a Google search for this, you're gonna find a lot of words, right? Today, we take it live. We are going to make this a live case study as these videos continue to get more and more popular for us. And what I wanna do today is we're going to walk through two separate things. First thing is gonna be what we call your Schedule A. On a Schedule A, this is really where you can see what the standard deduction would look like versus what your itemized deductions would look like. Sounds pretty simple, but I am still amazed by how many individuals don't really understand how this works. And it's a lot deeper than just donor advised funds. There's a lot of moving parts on this Schedule A. So I wanna walk through that. And then to end it, we're going to walk through our actual tax planning software, and I'm going to walk through different scenarios of what if you put in this amount, this amount, or this amount compared to nothing into a donor advised fund and how it can actually lower your tax bill. So we'll make it a live demonstration with real tax data from a sample client. And we're gonna walk through all of that, so stay tuned, it's all coming up next. Okay, before we make this our official live case study and my face is stuck on a computer screen, let's first do this. A donor advised fund. So what is a DAF, at least in the most simple form? A DAF, a donor advised fund, is really just an investment fund. You can go open one of these at a Vanguard, at a Fidelity, really any of the major brokerage houses, any of the major custodians out there. And the reason why DAFs have become very popular is because it's an easy way to bunch charitable contributions. So if you've ever heard the term bunching, Donor advised funds are a good way to do that. So for example, if every year you are giving $10,000 to your favorite charity, but then we look at your Schedule A, which we're gonna do next, and we see that you're not actually going above standard deduction. Now I know you're not making the $10,000 charitable contribution for your tax benefits, but I realize there's a lot of moving parts there, but it's a nice benefit to get, right? So it's one of those ones that we would aim for, but I'm still shocked by how many people are making that large contribution, but actually still not getting above a standard deduction or just getting above it, right? And they're not getting the full bang for their buck. So with a donor advised fund, instead of maybe doing three of those spread out, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, they may take a $30,000 lump sum and put it in one year to the donor advised fund. And the nice part about the donor advised fund is it will give them that full deduction in that given year. So you would get all 30,000 then in that current year. And then you could divvy up your 10,000. You could give out 10,000 next year, 10,000 next year, and 10,000 the following year. So you can still meet all your charitable giving goals, but you were just trying to get above a certain threshold in that given year. And that's, when you hear the term bunching contributions, that's really what you're seeing. And that's one of the big draws to the donor advised fund. Now there are other ways to utilize the donor advised fund. I'll tell you my personal favorite, with a lot of our clients towards the end of the year, we'll look through their taxable accounts and we'll see are there any stocks that have really appreciated a lot. So there's a lot of capital gains in there. Because in a perfect world, when you're working through a taxable account, you're trying to limit your tax hit, right? So if they were already going to give 25 or 50 or $100,000 to charity, we would come in and say, hey, keep that money in your checking account. Let's just go into your investment account. We'll clear out this basis. We'll transfer those positions into your donor advised fund. You're still making the, call it $50,000 charitable deduction here, the, the gift here into the donor advised fund, but you kept the $50,000 in your bank account. Now, if you wanted to, you could either keep the $50,000 in your bank account, or you could give the $50,000 into your joint account. And, and what we would usually say there is you're resetting your basis, right? But it was a way that you could essentially use some of the benefits of your current portfolio to transfer those into the donor advised fund and still accomplish all of your goals but you never had to write a check for it. So the donor advised fund has a lot of unique ways to utilize it, but that's at least the cliff notes of why a donor advised fund is such a neat tool and, and why it comes with a term of bunching contributions. But we're gonna build on this topic as we go here. So we're gonna stop this type of video. When you see me next, I will be in my computer screen. So let's get into the live case study. And we are live from the computer screen. All right, so what you see in front of you now is a Schedule A from 2022, it looks very similar for 2023. Oddly enough, I'm gonna use 2024 numbers. And the reason why I wanna use 2024 numbers is because you can't do a donor advised fund backwards, right? So if you're watching this video, this is not something that we can do backwards for a previous year. So now that we're in early 24, I'm going to utilize 2024 numbers. But this Schedule A is extremely helpful because I don't think a lot of people understand the difference between itemized and the standard deduction. And this is your walkthrough. This is easy, right? Of all the tax forms, I actually think the Schedule A 
is one of the easier ones to walk through. So let's do that. As always with my live videos, I will look down a little bit more than usual. You know I love good eye contact with you, but I'm gonna look down a little bit more than usual here. So schedule A, first thing you see at the top, medical and dental expenses. So uh, this household's income was right around, call it 400,000. Um, and they actually had a good amount of medical expenses. So out-of-pocket medical costs were still around, call it $15,000 in the year 2022, it looks like. Now, one thing that a lot of people may or may not know is while you can deduct medical expenses and dental expenses, it needs to be above 7.5% of your AGI number there. So with that 390, call it 391, even though they had 14,000 of medical cost, because they didn't go above 29,000, you can see they get a big old goose egg. So zero, all right? So that's part one. Hopefully you're not too worried about that. It's one of those ones where, you know, always keep track of them. Maybe you got to do the math at the start of the year, right? You say, all right, we have around $400,000 of income. Do we go above 30,000? Ideally not, right? Because you either weren't expecting costs that high or your health insurance kind of hung you out to dry there in terms of what they were covering. But that's sometimes catches you off guard. You know, sometimes just the birth of a child can be pretty darn expensive. Any types of surgeries, you know, you blow out a knee, you blow out a hip. They can just jump up quickly. That's one that's always important. That's seven and a half percent of the AGI. Now the next section, it says taxes you pay. This is your state and local taxes. For most of the continent here, I shouldn't say the continent of the U.S., you're going to be looking at state taxes. There's not that many local taxes. Now with me coming from the state of Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania has a lot of local taxes. New York City has local taxes. There's a lot of areas that do have their own local taxes, and that's all included here. Now here's the big caveat to this section. This is the current SALT limitation. S-A-L-T, state and local taxes, which are capped at 10,000. Now you can see for this household, they were only around 7,000, so they didn't get capped out. But if your income starts to get above that, your household income starts to go above that 400,000 number, you're likely gonna cap out around 10,000. This has been a huge tax negative for a lot of the households that we work with being physician households, where they do have a lot of, of state and local taxes that they're really missing out on. So keep an eye on that, but that is one that does come into this calculation. Next section is probably your easiest one, interest paid. If you own a home, this is your interest deduction. So whenever you hear people say, well, I'm gonna buy a home for the tax benefits. This is the section. This is actually where it shows up on paper. I really don't like that line because you should never do something because of the tax benefits of it in terms of buying something massive, right? But in this section, you can see that. So this household paid about $18,000 in mortgage interest in the year 2022. Gifts to charity, it looks like there was 5,050 and then another 500. In there, I'm assuming the 500 was probably like your, this is where, you know, if you, you take stuff to the Salvation Army and you go through your bag, you listed all your items and you say, you know, I think the total fair value using the calculator on their website for all these items, it's probably around 500 bucks. That's where you're listing that. The larger numbers are likely $5,000 charitable contribution. Now, this is also where the donor advice fund would come in, right? This could be where that would be listed and give you that large jump. Then you'll see, hopefully again, something you don't ever have to plug a number in for. There's line 15, line 16 is other itemized deductions. These lines can change. Like if you're looking at 23, could these be a little bit different? 24, could they be a little bit different? They could, but more or less getting the, the total idea here. But you can see for this family, their total deductions were right around 30,000. Now I wrote down 2023's numbers going into this video and the standard in 2023 was 27,700. Now this was 2022 again. So they were well above you know, when I say well above, you know, a couple thousand dollars above the standard deduction. So for this tax return, this Schedule A in particular, they would have taken the itemized deductions over the standard deduction because you got 30,000 versus call it like 26,000 or somewhere around that number. Now, what I wanna build on next is taking kind of this idea and building on it in terms of that donor advised fund. But now you can see, you know, what number should you be tracking to possibly itemize? And really the biggest things that you're looking for in terms of, of tracking would be medical expenses, taxes paid, that one's usually pretty easy, right? That's gonna really show up right there in your W-2 at the end of the year. Interest paid, that's your 1098E. I should have wrote that down before, but that's essentially the form you get from your mortgage provider at the end of the year that will show you your total payments and total interest. So you don't really have to track much there. One thing to keep an eye on that, if you moved in the middle of a year, don't forget, you're gonna have two of those. So if you started a year in Philadelphia, and half the year with that mortgage, and then you move to Tampa, Florida, like we did, you would have two separate mortgage interest deductions there. So don't lose track of that. We do see clients miss that one every now and then we pick it up when we're reviewing their tax return. And then the other thing would be charity. And that's what we're gonna build on here. So I'm going to pause this section here. I'm gonna switch over my software. We're gonna get into the tax planning software and we're going to actually show different numbers of the donor advised fund that would really get plugged into this gifts to charity section down here.
but we're gonna walk through it in the actual tax planning software. So let's pivot here and we'll get into that next section. We'll continue this deep dive. Okay, let's jump into the actual tax planning software. So my goal now is to show you four different scenarios. One of those scenarios is just the original tax return. Now, again, using 2024, because you can't do a donor advised fund contribution backwards. And that's really the main goal of this video, right? So if you're watching this early in 2024, you have a whole year of planning. Maybe you'll catch this a little bit later in the year, but working it for 2024, remember donor advised funds are always a 1231 deadline. So first up, what do we have here? This is our tax planning software, sample clients, not real clients, sample clients. 2024 is built in here. I just want to show you a few assumptions before we jump into it. So in here, you can see wages, 685,000, all W-2 income. I did that on purpose, two reasons. One, our actual sample client that we use in our financial planning software, they have all W-2 wages. But two, this is a great example of one of the most common complaints we hear from individuals that are W-2 only income. I get no good tax deductions. And while I'm not going to disagree with that compared to like 1099 business owners, this is one that you can take advantage of. That's why I really like this example only using W-2 wages. We plugged in some little things, right? There's some taxable interest. You got qualified dividends, total dividends. So we got some of the usual stuff in there. And those numbers, that's not the point of this video. Those numbers are a little bit lower, but we're just plugging in numbers so that you can see them. That gives you total income is going to be the same here. That makes sense, right? Same W-2 wages, a little bit of interest, a little bit of dividends. So that's all going to show up here. Schedule one deductions, also known as you're above the line. The only thing I plugged in here is the HSA. Now in this example, they're W-2 owners or W-2 physicians. So they wouldn't have, let's just assume they didn't do it through their payroll, right? They have a separate HSA through Fidelity and they just did that contribution. So it never showed up on their pay stub. And that's why we have it as a separate line item in here. And then what does that give you? That gives you your AGI. When they say above the line or below the line, the line is the AGI. Now, here's where we come back into that Schedule A. You can see it right here. Shout out Schedule A. It's back. Only things we're going to put in. We're going to put in the SALT limitation. Based on their income, they're going to hit the SALT limit. So when you plug in their state and the local taxes, they're over 10000 but they're going to get capped out at 10000 So that's pulling in for all of these lines here. It's not 30000 there. It's 10000 just being replicated on, on the software. I'm going to put the mortgage interest at 18000 Again, just plug in the number here. I'm actually using that more or less rounding up from the Schedule A that we saw in the last return. So when you put those two together, Together, this is interesting, right? So when you put those two together, which are really your most common Schedule A deductions, where are you at? You're at $28,000. Well, for 2024, what's the standard deduction? Well, if we scoop down just a smidge, we got it listed here. It's 29200 So this is a perfect example, right? These individuals are just off of itemizing. Now, they've almost done it perfectly. They have filled up the standard deduction by utilizing their SALT limitation of 10000 and then their mortgage interest. So these would be individuals that are really candidates for a slam dunk donor advised fund because really we're only going to, I'm going to use air quotes here, waste 1200 of that. And what I mean by waste is you got to get above the standard deduction before you itemize. So we still have to fill in the gap for another $1,200 before we're truly in itemized world. And that's another important caveat because let's just say they've rented, right? And the $18,000 was gone. So they only have the salt limitation of 10. They have to burn off waste another $19,000 before they're in itemized. So if they made a $25,000 charitable contribution, 19,000 of that, I don't want to say wasted because again, we do charitable giving because we, we want to give to that charity, but 19,000 of that had to be used up before they even hit the itemized deduction. So that's important. So you're trying to get as close as possible, if not over the standard deduction before you start to itemize. So I did that on purpose because I thought it was another good learning experience to plug in here. So when we scroll through all of these, we'll see, you know, here's the taxable income. Income. Now, I don't want to give it all away, so let's just scoot up. Again, up until this point, everything is the same. All I change is the donor advised fund amount. So we did a $25,000, a $50,000, and a $100,000. And if you're sitting there thinking, who the heck has $100,000 laying around? I want to emphasize what I said earlier about those taxable accounts. We actually do quite a few $100,000 or more charitable contributions every year, but we don't do it from a checkbook. We do it because their investment account had large gains in it, and it's a large number already and they're comfortable moving that into the donor advised fund to get a big tax benefit. And sometimes you time these up, right? It might be a year where they sold a business or their income was higher than usual. So we're going to get more aggressive to try to bring that down. So these aren't examples of, hey, I'm just going to write a check, right? Now, maybe you can do that. That's fantastic. But it can. that's why I wanted to go across the board here. You know, maybe 25,000 is just you bunching. You know, you usually do like 10,000 or so to charity. Boom, you can maybe do the 25,000 of the donor advised fund. But 25,000, 50,000, 100,000. Now let's see the actual fact. 
X, right? So first thing we stop here is just the standard versus itemized. So this was standard, 29,200. Well, now we're above it. We're at 53, we're itemized. Why? Donor advised fund. Now we're at 78. Why? Donor advised fund. 128, donor advised fund. And then you can see the actual effects on the taxable income. So of course, they're going to be lowered by those numbers. And this was the part I thought that would be most interesting in this video is to see, well, what does it actually do to my tax bill, right? It's one thing to hear the numbers, but to actually see the effects of it is really the neat part, right? So you can see here, 25,000 is here. We took the tax bill. I had to write these down so I didn't have to do the math on the run for you. Lower the tax bill here with a $25,000 contribution by $8,000. So $25,000 DAF, you lowered your tax bill by 8%, which if you're keeping score at home, that's an actual 5% deduction in your total tax bill. Not bad. Next situation here was 50,000. So in the $50,000 world, I lowered it by another 9,000, but I went down the line here. So essentially was saying like, hey, if you were gonna get this 164 number, we're now gonna get it down to 155. That's another $9,000 reduction. Now we're doubling here, but from 50 to 100, we we doubled up and we're saying, hey, if you go from 155 to 137, you lower your tax bill by another 17,000. Now let's just do this because I should have had this one in here. If you were sitting there and you're an individual that was going to be scenario one, essentially just an, a standard deduction, but now you come out and you say, I think I could easily do a hundred thousand dollar contribution to my donor advised fund from the actual gains in my current portfolio. You just lowered your actual tax bill by $35,000. That's a 20% reduction. So that's why the donor advised fund is really powerful. And now remember too, if you did a $100,000 donation to your donor advice fund, you don't have to go give out $100,000 tomorrow. That's the beauty of it. You might break that up over 10 years, right? You might do 10,000 per year. Hopefully you get some growth in there too, because in the donor advice fund, you can also get it invested. But I wanted to walk through a true scenario of what a donor advice fund can do for you. So here's some dollar numbers. Here's the actual 25, 50, 100, but you can actually see the effects of how it all funnels through your Schedule A, but then also what it can do to that final tax bill. So I hope this was helpful uh, to actually see this live as these case studies continue to get more and more traction. And there you have it how you can lower your tax bill by utilizing a donor advised fund and not just talking, but also showing you what the schedule A looks like and how the one, the donor advised fund, the DAF would actually show up there, but also how the, just the overall schedule A works and looking at those standard for those itemized deductions and then taking it one step further on actual tax scenarios of a 25,000 versus a 50 versus a hundred. This video was a little bit longer than usual because we got into the weeds and I love it. But as always, thanks for hanging out with me. If you have not subscribed, subscribe to the channel here. Click on this little bell icon. You'll get a notification anytime we release an awesome case study or any of our videos. Again, thanks for hanging out with me and I will catch you on the next video.